Is this on? Oh, you can hear me now, right? Yes. Okay, good. You can hear me now. Uh, I have never been to Alaska before, so I am learning a lot about Alaska. Like this guy who was telling me all about what hunting in Alaska is about. Right? I had no idea. <laughs> and um, yes, I was. That's okay. And then Art flew me around in some of the mountains, and that was really, really special. I really enjoyed that. Because my vision of Alaska, being from Florida and Italy, is that Alaska is all 20,000-foot peaks with all this wonderful, these wonderful glaciers and stuff. And I arrive in Anchorage, and I'm like, hey, wait a minute. This, is, this can't be Alaska. This is a, a city. You know, people in Alaska, they, they live out in the wilderness, right? So Art was kind enough to fly me over the wilderness, and just really, really special. Thank you so much. Um, I, uh, as you know, was supposed to lead a group of you to Israel a couple of years ago. We were interfered with by a pandemic that uh, created all kinds of issues in our lives. Um, and so then Gail said, well, would you be willing to come to Alaska to teach? And I thought, okay, well... It's a long way from Italy, but, <laughs> but I've never been to Alaska, so of course I should come to Alaska. So I'm very happy to be here and to meet all of you. Uh, I want to tell you that I'm going to use this chair because a year ago a truck in, in, in Italy had an, inter, uh, an interaction with my bicycle, and I ended up with a broken leg and a broken hand and many months in a wheelchair and all that kind of stuff, so it's hard for me to stand. So if I really get animated and I start walking around like Gail, who's very animated, I will end up having to sit down because my leg will start to hurt. Actually, it only hurts if I'm standing. As long as I'm walking around and moving, it's pretty good. So that's why the chair is here. Um, let me give you a sort of brief summary of what we're going to try to accomplish in the next three days. Why do I need to do that? Because I don't want you to be dissuaded about the academic side of this. Uh, we're going to talk about some pretty technical stuff. And you're going to say, why do I need to know that? Um, and the answer is, well, you don't. <laughs> but you're here. <laughs> no, actually, you need to know it because you want to know how you got here. right? What, what was it that brought you to try to understand what was happening in the, in the community of the Jewish nation and what was happening in the biblical text over the course of four or 5,000 years. How did that actually manifest itself in such a way that you end up here? Right? I have a, a friend in Israel, Moshe Kapinski, the rabbi. He has a bookstore there. And when you go to Israel, you will go and visit him, of course, and he will say to you, no one comes to Jerusalem by accident. God invites you. And if you accept the invitation and come, you will never be able to explain to anyone else what you actually experienced here. Because if, you don't, if you're not there, you can't actually articulate all the things that will happen. And that's one of the themes that we want to talk about in this next three days. The difference between your experience with God and the interpretation of the experience, which ends up in commentaries, theologies, philosophies, ritual, practice, those are all attempts to explain what actually happened in your life. What happened in your life was an experience that brought you to this place. Right? That experience will be different for every one of you. No two people have the same journey in life. Fortunately, God understands that. So all of those different journeys that are represented here, that show up here tonight, because God intended for you to be here, now you're, we're going to talk about how they get interpreted. And, of course, they don't get interpreted individually. They get interpreted within community. And so we'll have to talk about what happened to the text, what happened to the traditions, how were they developed, why do we have the translations that we have, all those kinds of technical things that will help you understand what is this book that I'm reading and where did it come from, okay? And... In order for you to, it, we want to start off with a nice little funny thing. In order for you to understand how important it is to realize that your frame of reference, the way that you think about the world, 
was not something that you decided. It was something that you inherited. It came from your own culture and your own assumptions about the way the world works. And so what I want to do, are we up there? Yeah. What I want to do is take a few minutes now to show you this really interesting little video. You can go and find it on YouTube if you want to afterwards about what happens when you try to change your assumptions. When you do some small thing that changes the way that you think the world works. Okay? So I don't... Am I supposed to see it up there? Oh, right click. There it is. And now I can see it way back there. Okay, so this is called the backwards bicycle. It's actually about an engineer who discovered that thinking isn't quite as simple as just rational logic, as we will see. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam, and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill, and I was really proud of it. Everything changed, though, when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses, and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Salmon. First attempt riding the bicycle. I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often. But I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're going to try some trick or they're just going to power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. No, 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 no. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. <laughs> All right, I'm sick. <laughs> All right, so uh, whatever you're in. Yeah. Wait, wait. No, no, you have to keep your feet on. <laughs> Dude, this is hard. Let's see if we got it. Let's get it. Wait, wait, wait. Like, you gotta start rolling at least. Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. So here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck. But at least I could ride it. 
My son is the closest person to me genetically, and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you going to give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up. You got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he, in how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike log. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a Smarter Every Day meetup, if you will, and I'm gonna see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm gonna try to ride a normal bike. Backwards. Backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I proved is that I could only redesignate that bias. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American <laughs> that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this because I've learned and unlearned. All right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, I'm back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, click, click, hold it, click. I got it, I got it. Okay, there it is. There was the moment. Good. Okay, I can run a bike. I tried to explain this to the people around me and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes and I couldn't get anybody to believe me. That looked like I faked that, didn't it? Yeah. Just a fake. Yeah. You think I'm faking? You don't fool me. That looks so weird to be like, la, 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 and it's full. You think I'm lying, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I do. I'm not lying. <laughs> I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things, because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin. You're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. There you go. That's a great, great video if you want to try to explain to someone why they don't think like you do. <laughs> because what, remember what he said? For all, what he discovered is that the neural pathway that helped him realize how the world worked, which is how he rode the bike to begin with, was something that was so fixed that it was almost impossible to change it. Okay? Well, you're in that learning to unlearn how to ride a bike. That's why you're here. Because you're trying to change the neural pathway about the way that you think about religion, about God, about, about scripture, and it's not easy. In fact, you'll have somebody, up, somebody else that you used to know come up and say to you, why are you doing that? And it's like saying, can't you ride a bike? And obviously the answer is, no, I can't ride the bike anymore because I've trained my mind to think differently. And trying to explain that is like trying to explain to people in Amsterdam that he wasn't really faking, he just couldn't ride a bike anymore, okay? So, you will have lots of people who just don't understand the kind of experience that you've had because they're still riding the bikes the way that they always thought bikes should be ridden, okay? So now what we're going to do is examine how those things happen in the history of basically the Bible and what happened to that set of documents that led us to a different pathway, okay? Now, uh, I would like to offer the possibility of you raising your hand and saying, I have a question, and I'm happy for you to do that, except that I always have the option to say, no thanks, <laughs> and we'll take that question later, because what I've discovered is that most questions get answered if you wait, okay? 
you'll have the question now, and then three slides later, we'll actually be talking about it. But if you have a burning question that you just have to know the answer, except anything about, I, I will not answer any questions about the end times. But any other question that you want to ask, if it's burning in your heart and you have to ask it, or you need, it just has to come out, then please just stop me and say, hey, wait, I have a question. And if it actually turns out that your question will be answered later, I'll just tell you, okay, hang on, we'll get there, okay? So let's see what happens. You know, I can't read them back here, so I'm going to have to read them this way. Paradigms. That's what we're talking about. That's what Justin was talking about with the bicycle, right? It's called a paradigm. It's a philosophical term that means the set of conscious and unconscious assumptions that govern the way that you think about the world, okay? Um, I'll give you an example. When the atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, there was a whole group of physicists right, who claimed that it was a media event, that it actually didn't happen. And the reason they claimed that is because they believed in the Bohr model of the atom, which means that the nucleus of the atom was the smallest building block of all matter and could not be made smaller. It couldn't be broken apart because the paradigm said this is the smallest. If it's the smallest, there's nothing smaller than the smallest. So the atomic bomb couldn't happen. Okay? It didn't matter what the evidence was. Give me all the pictures, give me the videos, everything else. It doesn't matter because it was all faked because the paradigm said it couldn't happen. And in fact, the, a great number of very intelligent physicists went to their graves believing that the atomic bomb in Nagasaki and Hiroshima was just fake, right? Because the evidence didn't fit their paradigm, okay? Now, we're going to face the same kind of thing when we start looking at the way paradigms work when we come to the biblical text because we all have paradigms that function to tell us what the Bible is about, how it works, how we interpret it, what it means. All those kinds of things are conscious and unconscious assumptions about what God is doing with his word. Okay? So remember this. Once method determines our perspective on the sources, how we see is really what we get. It's like saying... Once you make up your mind, you'll find the evidence to support it, <laughs> right? It's not a matter of looking at the evidence and then deciding what it means. The naive view of science is that we just go, we have a hypothesis, we go out, examine the world and see if it fits. That's not what really happens. What really happens is you already have an assumption about what you will find, and lo and behold, you find it. Isn't it amazing? Okay? So we want to make sure that we understand the assumptions because the assumptions are going to govern what we actually see in the world. All right? All right. So this is from Zornberg's book, Bewilderments. I'm going to talk about a lot of authors that you probably should know, especially you, Dave. You have to know this. Okay? okay. So <laughs> you need to read Avia Gottlieb Zornberg. The, word, the book is Bewilderments, right? The reason that you need to read that is because it's about the book of Numbers, and it's her commentary. She's a very, very famous Jewish uh, scholar who writes about the book of Numbers, and she says, and she's quoting from Safat Emet, the whole of Torah, writes Safat Emet, is a complex of hints, illusions to the unattainable. Wait, wait. I thought the Torah was the history of the Jews, God's commandments, and that everything was just laid out there in black and white so that I can understand it. That's not what Sefat Emet, who is one of the great medieval commentators, right? That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, hey, listen, something else is happening in Scripture, something you're not aware of, <coughs> but you need to be. Because the underlying fabric of scripture isn't about God delivering a Boy Scout manual for living. It's about something else. And we want to find out what the something else is so that we can see how our own assumptions have affected the way that we look at the text. Okay? So, what really happened in Egypt becomes 
a less important question than how best to tell the story. Okay? Not, in other words, I will help you, hopefully, over the next few days to see that what's really happening in Scripture is storytelling, not event reporting. And there's a big difference, right? The, the ancient world has a very different view of history than our view. Our view is, I was going to say it's like CNN, but of course that's not history either. <laughs> so our view is that we report things chronologically because we believe we have an assumption. You know, one of those assumptions is it's called cause and effect, right? That something happens and it makes something else happen. Where do you suppose that idea came from? Do you suppose that we had this theory about cause and effect and we went out in the world to see if causes always caused effects, right? No, I would suggest to you that the idea came from Greek philosophy in the 5th century BC and we inherited it. So we expect the world to be cause and effect and consequently we read the history of scripture in terms of a Greek idea of cause and effect. We turn it into our version of history. But in the ancient world, they didn't believe that. That's why when you read scripture carefully, you will discover that some events that happened before other events are reported happening after those events. Some events are just completely out of order. Some events that aren't reported in one place are reported someplace else as though they were continuous. Some events are modified from one book to the other. You know, the book of Kings mo is modified in the book of Chronicles. The same events that happen in Kings aren't reported in the same way that happens in Chronicles. Why? You would say to yourself, well, they couldn't be mistaken. There must be a reason, right? I mean, it's scripture. It can't be a mistake, so there has to be another reason. And then we'll go through all these machinations to try to prove that the bomb that dropped in Nagasaki was just a media event. Because we can't understand how the scripture, if it's all about event reporting, right, what happened next, causality, we can't understand how they could get it wrong. Was, was it 700 people or 7,000 people? You can make some mistakes, but that one's a pretty big one, right? Was it uh, Solomon was such a really great king and he just did all these wonderful things? Or was it that Solomon was affected by his, his multiple wives to become an idolater? Which is right? Well, which one do you think politically fits the situation? I mean, you know, let's pretend, not pretend that the Bible isn't about real people with politics and social issues and economics and everything else, right? So that gets built into the text. We'll look at some of the assumptions behind that. But the point is that we want to find out how the events are reported, not what the events are reported. We want to understand what happened to the audience that actually heard them and why did they need to hear it that way, okay? So both Jewish and Christian exegesis assume certain frameworks that limit discovery, right? Don't think, oh my gosh, we'll just become Jewish and all these problems will be solved, <laughs> right? That's not going to happen. Because Christian commentators often make the same assumptions that Jewish commentators make. And there's a reason for that. It's called Hellenism, right? In the 4th century BC, after Alexander the Great was finished conquering the known world, he infected the whole world with Greek thought called Hellenism. And the rabbis of the 4th, 3rd, 2nd, 1st centuries BC were also influenced by Hellenism. If you're really, really interested in that, here's a great book for you. Martin Hengel, right? Hellenism, Judaism and Hellenism. A great book. Now, let me warn you. The book is 750 pages long. The second volume is 750 pages of footnotes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's a fabulous book because what it shows you is how much Hellenism affected Judaism. You know, we think Hellenisms, Hellenists or Hellenes were the bad guys. The Greeks, you know, they, they got their philosophy and they just hammered it home in the Western world. And those guys were on the outside and the Jews were on the inside. The Jews were the special chosen people. But in fact, when we look at the rabbinic texts, we see the cross-cultural influence. 
What do you know? And if you take a, a Siddur, you know, the Jewish prayer book, and you look at some of the prayers, I, I mean, I can point out to you Neoplatonic ideas, Aristotelian ideas that are in the Siddur. Why? Because the people who wrote the prayers were influenced by Hellenism. D does that shock you? It shouldn't, because whatever Christian background you had before you got here also influences how you think about why you're here. Right? Remember, the word Protestant means protesting. You know, so you have to protest something, right? You can't be a protest Protestant unless you're protesting something. Otherwise, you'd be a Catholic. So you might as well protest and be somebody else, right? But that means that the framework that brings you into being a Protestant came from Catholicism. And where do you suppose that framework came from? It came from an anti-Judaism, right? So all of these ideas are essentially, eventually related. And that's what it's saying here. Awareness of the framework is the first requirement. What's the framework? Who's the audience? What did they expect? What was the culture like? What historical period is it? What, what language and vocabulary were used in that time? Remember, there's that great line in Genesis after Noah gets off the ark where it says, um, Noah, you know, Noah gave these sacrifices, and then there's a line in there about how these now make everything food. Okay, the problem is that the word food in Judaism doesn't mean everything that you can digest. It only means the things that God tells you that you can digest, right? So we translate the word food and we think, oh man, great, clams, shellfish, you know, some really great shark, et cetera, et cetera, because for food means for us anything I can put in my mouth that doesn't kill me, <laughs> right? Okay, but that's not what the word food means in scripture because the word food, ah, you're saying, you're, but you're going to say, yeah, but Noah didn't have the commandments yet. He didn't know about the food laws. It was Noah, and to which I will say, yeah, but the person who wrote the story about Noah knew the food laws. And so he put that back into the text so that you would understand that Noah was doing the things that God wanted him to do, even if Noah didn't know about it, mm. right? In other words, Noah didn't write the story. Somebody else wrote the story about Noah. So I need to know what time was the story written so I can figure out the cultural audience and the vocabulary of that audience when the story was written, not when the story was supposed to happen. Okay? And the same thing happens in Mark. You know, there's that wonderful passage, and by this he made all foods clean. Right? But let's go back and ask, what was the Greek text? What was the audience? What did the Greek words mean? Oh, what did the Hebrew words mean that the Greek words are supposed to translate? We need to have a lot of work to do before we can actually say that any of those verses actually say what they say in English, right? Right? Okay. So, the first requirement is to figure out who's the audience. Now, can I make a, just a small comment? You sang a great song tonight. And I remember, I started by saying that we're here because we've all had an experience and the experience drew us here, not the interpretation of the experience, not the exegesis, not the words of scripture, but the actual thing that happened in my heart that drew me into this way of thinking, okay? Now I'm trying to understand the way of thinking, but the experience comes before that, okay? Now you sang a song tonight. In the song, you sang about the sons of Abraham, the daughters of Zion. And you sang it thinking that those words were written for you. I will let that sink in, because they weren't, right? Those words weren't written for you. The Bible wasn't written for you. The Bible was written for a group of people called Israelites, who were the direct descendants of Abraham, who God chose to bring through all of these various occurrences so that he would say, you, Israel, are my chosen people. Now, you're going to say, yeah, but I'm grafted into Israel. Well, wait for Paul. Because before Paul, you don't have the grafted in. You have the stranger who goes along with the group, right? Who practices the rituals, et cetera, et cetera. But the text wasn't written for the stranger. It was written for those who were chosen, right? 
So the sons of Abraham and the daughters of Zion, if you go to my friend Moshe Kapinski in Israel, will tell you that doesn't apply to Norwegians, me, uh, Italians, my wife, or I wonder if, Ala is Alaska an ethnicity? Probably. <laughs> okay. So anyway, you understand what I'm saying? That the first thing I have to remember, the framework is what matters. So the first thing I have to do is ask myself, who was the audience? Right? I'm reading a document that's 2,000 years old. It was written for somebody else. That doesn't mean it doesn't apply to me. It doesn't mean that I can't take the text and find an application. But it wasn't written to me. It was written to someone else. And I want, in order to understand what it meant when it was written, I need to know the culture, the vocabulary, the political, economic, and social circumstances of what was happening at the time. Right? And we're going to investigate that stuff. But that's, that's what exegesis means. So when you tell me, this is what the verse in Thessalonians means, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, okay, was that what the Thessalonians thought? Or are you telling me what you think the Thessalonians thought because you're reading it according to the framework of the backwards bicycle? Right? I need to know that you understand the culture, economic, social, political environment of the Thessalonians if you're going to tell me what the Bible, what Paul was writing to the Thessalonians about. Okay? And let me give you an example. You, you know, right, already you know that I'm not a politically correct guy, right? Um, I'm also not religiously correct. Maybe that's why, that's, that's why I don't actually fit anywhere, but that's okay. It, you can, you, here's the deal. You can take what you want and leave the rest on the shelf, okay? But I'm going to give you an example of how we misinterpret what was happening because we read the text according to our modern tradition rather than asking what was happening to the original audience, okay? And the example I'm going to use is speaking in tongues. Okay? The comment that Paul makes about speaking in tongues only happens in one letter, the letter to the Corinthians. Okay? He doesn't talk about it to the Romans, the Galatians, the Ephesians, he doesn't talk with Timothy, just there, right? So the first thing I would want to ask is, oh, okay, so since Paul's writing personal letters, he's not writing scripture, right? He's writing personal letters, which later become canonized. I want to know, what was the problem that he was facing that made him talk about speaking in tongues to the Corinthians and not anybody else, okay? And so for that, I need to know what was happening in Corinth. Well, tell me what you know about Corinth. <laughs> Corinth was a Roman pagan port city. So guess what was in Corinth? Everything. The temple to Zeus, Diana, Artemis, go right down the list. In fact, if you didn't like what was happening in this religious assembly, you just had to walk out, go down the street two, you know, two blocks, and there was another one. Okay? And in fact, this is really another interesting thing that you should know. Paul doesn't use, when he talks about the quote-unquote church, he uses the word, what's the, what's the Greek word for church? Ekklesia. Okay? Do you know in Greek, ekklesia doesn't mean church. It doesn't have anything to do with religion. There is a religious word for church in Greek. Guess what the word is? Synagoge. Okay? Why doesn't Paul use the word synagoge? Because it means a religious assembly. And there's a synagogue of Zeus. There's a synagogue of Artemis. There's a synagogue of Diana. So what he says is, I don't want you to think that we have a religious assembly going on like the rest of those. Okay? Oh, oh, wait, you're going to say, wait a minute, synagogue, that's a Jewish word. Yeah, it is now. But in the first century, it meant any religious assembly. So Paul chooses a word that doesn't mean religious assembly, right? In other words, an ecclesia is a civil assembly. It's the kind of a group that gets together to determine whether they're going to raise the rates in the public parking lots, Right? It's a political civil assembly. Why does Paul use that word? Because he doesn't want his Gentile audience, remember he's writing to Gentiles, he doesn't want them to think that this assembly is just like the synagogue of Zeus, the synagogue of Ar Artemis, right? He makes it different. In fact, he uses a word that doesn't belong. And if you were a Greek-speaking pagan in the first century, and Paul says, the ecclesia in the house of... Dor you would go, 
Eccles, what are you talking, what's he talking about? That, that's like the town hall meeting. And he would say, yeah, that's right, because it isn't like the religious meeting of Zeus. Okay? But we don't know that, do we? Because now ecclesia means church. And by the way, that comes from German, Kirk, which is a mistranslation of the Greek anyway. Right? So every time you go through your Bible now, especially in the apostolic writings, and you see the word church, I want you to cross it out. Because it doesn't mean church. Oh, and you're going to say, well, what does it mean? Well, it means a political assembly that just happens to have a religious flavor. <laughs> right? Okay, so politics was part of the original foundation of the idea of the ecclesia, because it was a town... Oh, and that, by the way, not surprisingly, Paul uses that concept because the synagogue in Israel was a public meeting place. It wasn't just for worship. It was for everything that happened with the community, right? Okay, so Paul's just trying to make that, that make sense in Greek, okay? So... Now, let's talk about speaking in tongues. What does speaking in tongues mean in Corinth? Well, in Corinth, you had assemblies, religious assemblies, that depended on oracles. What's an oracle? It's a place where you go to encounter two people, the manic, the one who is in direct contact with the gods, and the prophet who interprets what the manic says. Okay? Oh, no. The manic doesn't always say anything. The manic can roll around on the floor. The manic can froth at the mouth. The manic can jump up and down. The manic can speak in a language that no one understands, speaking in tongues. And the prophet comes along behind the manic and says, this is what she is saying to you. What's the difference? In the Greek culture, an oracle is consulted for a personal issue. Right? I want to know whether... Dave's going to get the moose next, next time he goes out to hunt because I'll go with him if he's going to get a moose, but I don't want to go with him if I'm just going to trot around in the bush for 10 days and not see anything. So I go to the oracle of Eureka. I go to the oracle of Eureka, and I ask Oracle, if I go with Dave, am I just going to waste my time or am I going to actually get something, right? And the oracle comes back, and the prophet says, you're going to get a moose. <laughs> okay? Now pay. <laughs> because you had to pay for the answer from the prophet, right? That's how Delphi made so much money. People paid to get the right answer. Okay? It's also interesting that Delphi was the place where the people who came with the answer about whether I should do business in Egypt came to the oracle, and they asked the question, which I do business in Egypt. And the oracle would say, come back in three weeks, and I'll tell you. And in the three weeks' time, somebody from Egypt would come and say, you know, should I do business with these guys in Israel? And the oracle would say, come back in three weeks and I'll tell you. And then all it did was match up the communication, right? So, but nevertheless, oracles were manics who spoke in languages no one understood and prophets who interpreted that. Now go to the Corinthian assembly, the ecclesia, right? It's filled with, it's filled with pagans, who have now decided that they want to practice a Jewish way of life, but guess what? They bring all those ideas with them. Right? So it's happening in the pagan assembly that people are speaking in languages no one understands, and what does Paul say? I'll have an interpreter because it's for the benefit of everybody. Ah, big difference. It's not for the benefit of you, it's for the benefit of everyone. If it doesn't benefit everyone, it isn't legitimate. So Paul's trying to bring control, bring some, you know, some order to the craziness that's going on in Corinth. And if you read the rest of the letter, you'll see it was really crazy, right? And he's doing it in an environment that they already understood. That's the point. The audience didn't have any problem with what he was saying because they already understood it from all of their background with oracles, okay? And that's why Paul only talks about it in Corinthians because there's no problem in Rome. Right? There's no problem in Galatia. It's only in this crazy place called Corinth where all these guys are doing these you know, ridiculous Greek, Greek pagan things and they bring them along. And by the way, you do the same thing. right? You may not consult an oracle, but you showed up here with all the background that you already had from your personal journey. And when you make that known, it's for the public now to decide how to interpret 
what, how your interpretation fits with all the rest of the community interpretation. Right? It's not a matter of, I have a word from God. Great, but let's see how it works with all the rest of the journeys that are collected here tonight. All right, got it? Okay. When? Yeah. You know, the, my, the problem is I didn't pay the oracle, so I'm not sure if I'm going to get... <laughs> Not sure if I'm going to get the right advice. You can pay Dave, though. <laughs> I think that defeats the, pro the purpose. Okay, so you understand what I'm saying? That you all come with your individual background, just like in Corinth, and if we don't understand what was happening in Corinth, because we haven't explored the history of what was happening there, and we just assume that Paul's talking about speaking in tongues for everybody, right? then we'll make the same mistake of thinking that Dave is the greatest moose hunter in Alaska, and we should just all follow him, right? That's true. <laughs> That's true. See, he has a paradigm. <laughs> okay, so that means we have some basic assumptions that we have to deal with. Now, you might already have anticipated that we're not going to get through this material, <laughs> okay? Because I'm giving you the outline up here, and then I give you the discussion, okay? That, by the way, is exactly what happens in the Bible. The Bible gives you the outline, and you have to fill in the discussion. Why do I say that? Because if you read Hebrew, you will notice that there's an, that first there are no vowels, right? So you have to fill it in. You can't read Hebrew without interpreting Hebrew, because you have to put the vowels in. So if you put the vowels in, how, where did you learn to put the vowels in? Somebody had to... This is the amazing thing about Hebrew. You can't read it unless you already know what it says. That's right. Right? <laughs> it's impossible to read the language without already knowing it because there are no vowels, so somebody has to tell you what it says so you can put the proper vowels in. Right? Forget the Masorites. We'll get to them eventually. But in the 10th century, they got sick and tired of that and said, okay, we're going to put the vowels in so everybody will read it the same way. But before the 10th century, people were reading it the way that they were taught to read it. And how were they taught to read it? by the tradition that they came from, which wasn't the, your tradition is different than his. Look at he's already depressed. <laughs> right? he's, saying, he's saying to himself, San Francisco's not going to make it this year. Right? Okay, the point is, you see, everybody's journey is different. So if you have a different set of vowels for the same verse, who's going to tell you you don't have the right vowels? All you have to do is say, God gave me those vowels. No one can argue. Because there weren't any vowels. So put in whatever you want. I can show you some verses that make huge difference over the cantillation marks. You know, the cantor who sort of sings out the verses, right? There's, there's a, in the Masoretic text, you didn't want to know all this stuff, but as long as you're here, I'm going to inflict it on you. Yeah, right? Okay? In the Masoretic text, there's a, a two dots. It looks like a colon goes underneath the letter, and it tells you that that letter doesn't have a vowel, and it's the end of the syllable, okay? The Masoretes put those colons in there. They weren't in the original text, which means if I take them out, the syllabication of a word might change. And if the syllabication of a word changes in a word that doesn't have vowels, it might actually say something else, right? Now, I'll tell you why that's important, because there's that great verse that every woman knows, where it says, um, I will greatly increase your pain in childbirth. Isn't that a wonderful verse? Every man knows the implications of this verse. You are under my thumb, because God blessed me and told me that you should be my servant. That's the verses, that, you know, look, God's going to punish you because you're responsible for sin, right? You caused the first sin, so of course God has to punish you, and he's, how is he going to do that? Make it real painful for you to have children. That sounds like a real benevolent God to me, doesn't it? Sounds like the God who... Yeah, that's right, but then he'll get you some other way, right? I mean, the whole point is, think about that. This is a God who describes himself as compassionate, forgiving, long-suffering, merciful. And then he says to women, by the way, you screwed up so badly, I'm going to make it hard for you to have children. Really hard. I will greatly increase. Okay? But the interesting thing about that is it depends on the vowels and the, syllabi and the syllabus. So if I take out the syllabication and take out the vowels, guess what? I get a very different verse. A verse that reads something like, He has seduced you, the serpent. Has nothing to do with childbirth pain at all. 
Oh my gosh. You're off the hook. Yeah, and there's a book back there called Guardian Angel, which is about understanding the first three chapters, or the second chapter and third chapter of Genesis, that story, in a different way that doesn't depend on the traditional vowels, right? Because, remember, the original text didn't have any vowels. So someone, a man, of course, like Dave, had to decide where the vowels go. And it was easy to decide that the vowels should support me in my priority rather than women. But if I take out the vowels, I get a very different story. Mm. A very different story. Yeah, but did God greatly increase your pain in order to punish you for sin? <laughs> yeah, the whole point is, think about this. In the Jewish world, childbirth is one of the most celebrated things that can happen. It's a blessing. It's a glory. Sure, it hurts, but you know, all suffering is, uh, suffering is, a, is a fundamental function of human life, right? I mean, you know, Dave knows he's got to suffer by going through all that bush to find the moose for eat for eating, right? Yeah? It's not like he can just open his door and there's a moose waiting for him to shoot it, right? No, he's got to go out there, okay? So you're right. Childbirth is painful, but the verse implies that God uses that pain to punish you, and nothing else in the Jewish world suggests that. So why does the verse suggest that? Because I read it according to the way that it's been pointed, right? And the traditional explanation, which goes back to a Catholic priest named Pagnino. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> the Catholic priest had a lot of reason for making sure that women stayed down. Okay? So the book Guardian Angel will help you figure out all what was really going on there. But the point is this, right? We believe assumptions about the text, and so we read the text accordingly. And one of those assumptions, a more fundamental one, is that God is the author of all the texts. So since there's only one author, it should be uniform all the way through. Whatever God says in one place can't be contradicted someplace else, right? Where did we get that idea? Where did the idea come from that every book in the Bible, every verse, every line in the Bible was exactly what God wanted the authors, the prophets, etc., to say? And that there's really only one author, the God behind it all, right? Where did we get that idea? Yes, I'm waiting. King James. Well, we got the idea. Yes? Oh, thank you very much. 2 Timothy 3.16. Is that right? All scripture is, is theonuptos. God breathed. That's Greek. All scripture is theonuptos and is profitable for... Da, 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 okay? So what did Paul mean by all scripture? Uh, okay, well, Torah, is, if we're technical, Torah is the first five books. So did Paul mean the first five books? Or did Paul have the common first century view of Torah, which was all of the books that we presently include in the Tanakh? Oh, except Ezra, Nehemiah, Song of Solomon, and a few others that were still being debated. Oh, you didn't know that? The, the Jewish, there was no Jewish canon in the first century canonization happened because the Christian church decided that those books belong in our Bible. And the Jews said, wait a minute, there are books, what are you doing? Well, I guess we have to have a list. Because before that, they didn't have a list. Right? So when Eusebius created a list for Constantine, he set off a chain of events where the Jews now started to have to say, okay, well, wait a minute, that's our book. Okay? So now, canon, so canonization happens really, really late, okay? Way after Paul is dead. So what does he mean by all scripture? Ah, maybe we have to ask, what does the word, in Greek, it's graphe, what does the word writing mean when Paul uses it? And now I need to know the audience, the culture, the background, et cetera, et cetera, when Paul uses it, right? Does Paul mean the... Does Paul mean the same sources that Jude uses? The Testament of the Twelve, the Assumption of Moses, First Enoch. Have you read those? You studied those in your Bible? First Enoch, the Testament of Twelve. Has anybody ever read the Testament of Twelve? If you say yes, I want to know right away because it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> okay? It's been lost. 
Jude cites it, but no one has ever seen it because it doesn't exist anymore. Okay? Assumption of Moses, first, first Enoch was really an important book. In fact, the notion of the Son of Man in Matthew depends on first Enoch, not on Daniel. Ooh, wow. And we thought, one author, it's all the same, everything is right, exactly it's supposed to be. Where did that idea come from? It came from the Catholic and the Protestant reformers who developed a doctrine in order to close ranks on what was going to be accepted. Right? I mean, you can't have, you can't have a sacred community that just accepts all kinds of texts. Can you? You need conformity. And what we discover, of course, is that as we go along in history, religion wants conformity. It wants rules to tell you that this is what you must believe, and if you believe that, you're out, or you're worse, it's, you're a heretic. Okay? But in the first century, no such rules existed. Communities had all kinds of texts, like First Enoch, right? and the Assumption of Moses, and they treated those as authoritative texts. If we, we eventually, we look at the work in Qumran, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls don't always match up with the Masoretic text, which is the text that we use for the development of what we call the Old Testament, right? We'd rely on the Masoretes. That's the 10th century of the Common Era. The Qumran text is from the first century of the Common Era, a thousand years earlier, right? Which means it's much closer to the time of Yeshua by a thousand years. And in Qumran, they don't have the same idea of canon that we have, okay? So this assumption that God's the author of it all and, all, and we'll find uniformity throughout the whole thing probably isn't correct. That we should find diversity, that we should find paradox, that we should find contradiction because the texts were written for particular audiences and combined much later by authorities that assumed that we needed one standard Bible. <clears throat> Tomorrow, we'll talk about contemporary scholarship on this issue, and one of the people that, you're gonna, that I'm going to talk about is Sidney White Crawford, who has some very powerful things to say about what actually happened to the Bible in the first century, to the, the Bible of the first century, okay? But this assumption, which most of us lived with, if you grew up in a Christian church, you had this assumption, right? That's why people would say, the only way to really do exegesis of a verse is the Bible has to interpret itself. So you find another verse to interpret this verse. Instead of looking at the social, political, historical culture that the uh, that the verse came from, you just look for other verses in the text. And by the way, have you read any of the rabbinic commentaries? Do you, have you followed any of what the rabbis do? They're, they're, they're fabulous guys, because what they'll say is, this verse in Genesis can be explained by this verse in Psalms. Oh my gosh, the Genesis text was written a thousand years before this verse in Psalms? So, how can I take a verse from Psalms a thousand years later and use it to interpret a verse in Genesis? That's like saying, the reason that I can interpret Galatians is because I've read Romans. <laughs> but Romans comes last, right? So I can't look at, at Paul's work and say, you know, I'll use the book of Romans. By the way, you know why Romans comes in the, in the order that it does in the New Testament? Okay, so we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, got those, the Gospels. Then we have Acts, right? The, the activity of the disciples, and then we have Romans. Why do we have Romans? Why, did, why does it go Romans and then all the other Pauline letters? I'm sorry? Yeah. The, the choice of where it got put in the New Testament was, was how long it was. Romans is the biggest one, so it comes first. The next biggest one, then the next biggest one, then the next biggest one. It had nothing to do with the chronology, which means that if you really want to understand Paul, you have to read it you have to read him according to the, the time that he wrote the books, not the, the biggest one to the smallest one, right? You need to understand that Paul's thought developed. And as it developed, if you start reading with the first letter that he wrote and then read all the letters in their chronological order, you can see that his 
thought and his concerns for the people develop, just like you would expect any other itinerant preacher who's moving around all over the Mediterranean world, just like any other human being, right? Okay, so everything in the Bible is ultimately ap applicable today in some form or another. That's another one of our basic assumptions, right? Everything in the Bible is true, and it applies to me. Right, Gail? Well, I hope not, because you wouldn't be wearing pants. <laughs> right? And forget that jewelry and the gold braid and the hair and all the other kind of stuff, because doesn't Corinthians tell you those women, they're, they're out of here, right? I mean, I know a New York Manhattan Pentecostal Holiness Church that excommunicated women for wearing pants in church, right? So everything in the Bible is written for me today exactly as, no, I mean, we know that. We, we functionally know that. We functionally know that some of that stuff was for the first century. But practically, we start, we start applying it in the same way, like it all means the same thing to us, right? We forget that the vocabulary changed, the social conditions changed, the politics changed, the economics changed, and we act as though, because God was the ultimate author of it all, it's all for me, right? Until I get to the verse that says, bash the baby's heads against the rocks. And then I'm like, ah, that's a tough verse. <laughs> yeah. The, there's a bunch of psalms like that, right? We have to remember, what was David going through when he wrote those? It doesn't mean that it's for me. It means that I'm experiencing in language what David was experiencing in his heart. And he was writing about it, right? Same thing with Paul. Paul would run across a problem. He'd say, okay, this is how I want to fix this problem. Remember that great line in, in Timothy where he says, uh, uh, all the, everyone's going to, uh, well, it's about, the woman is going to have, in her childbearing will save. Well, I can't remember exactly how the verse goes now, but you got the idea. There's a verse in there where he talks about childbearing as though it's a salvation event, right? Or how about James? Lay hands on people and pray for them and they'll get healed. Oh, and by the way, they're saved at the same time, right? I mean, do we really function like that? Or do we say, do we practically act as though, yeah, some of that stuff really applies to the first century and some of it doesn't. We just don't say that because we have a doctrine that tells us that it's all the same, okay? And finally, of course, the goal of exegesis is really application, which is why we can sing Sons of Abraham and Daughters of Zion, because the real goal is application. But is that exegesis? No. Exegesis is what did it mean to the original audience when it was written? That's exegesis. Once you know that, now you can start talking about application. But if you don't know that, <coughs> then you're speculating. Okay? Yeah. That's okay. We do it all the time. Okay. <coughs> so, because of the disorder, <coughs> I'll have to read this to you. Because of the disorder of historical experience, stop. Because of the disorder of historical experience, this is Zornberg, right? I think. Yes. This is Particulars of Rapture, is her book about Exodus. What she says is, oh my gosh, the Exodus chronology doesn't actually fit. Okay? So what she says is, the disorder of historical experience. That means in the Jewish world, things aren't written in chronological order. They're written in order of importance. It's a big difference. The historian, quote unquote, <clears throat> in Judaism, writes what's important first, and then writes what's next important and then writes what's next important. It doesn't matter what the chronology is. It matters what he really wants you to know. Okay? And you would have recognized that if you realized that Hebrew syntax, you know what the word syntax means? See, I told you this was going to be academic. <laughs> syntax is the order of the words in a sentence. Okay? We have a syntax in English. Noun, subject, or noun, subject, verb, direct object or whatever that comes afterwards. But the subject comes first and the verb comes second. You know that isn't true in Hebrew, right? In Hebrew, often the verb comes first because the verb is the most important thing, not the subject. In other words, 
What matters in Hebrew is the doing, not who's doing it, but the doing, okay? Right? And by the way, Hebrew doesn't have punctuation. You know that, right? No commas, no periods, no quotation marks, no exclamation points, nothing. So if you have a language without punctuation, what do you do to make sure that the important things are important? You put them first, right? In other words, the reason you put the verb first is because it's important. All the rest of the stuff is nice, but it's commentary. The verb is what matters, okay? The same thing happens in Greek. In Greek, importance means comes first, right? When we translate those verses into English from Hebrew or Greek, we change the syntax so that it fits the English version, which is subject, then verb. And as a result of that, what happens to the importance? It vanishes because we don't know in the, in the English syntax that this verb was more important than the noun, right? That the, what really mattered to the author was the doing of it, not the subject, not the person doing it, but the actual doing. We don't know that because we've changed the syntax to match up with our English, okay? So when you read an English Bible, you're reading the translator's view of how the verse would have meant if it were written in English, but it, weren't, it wasn't written in English, okay? So, the disorder of historical experience means that in historical experience in Hebrew, it's all chopped up, right? It isn't in chronological, it isn't cause and effect. It's whatever matters first, okay? So she says, there is a need for the ordering modalities of narrative. In other words, what came first, the storytelling or the writing? Storytelling. The storytelling, right? What came first is the storytelling. Then somebody wrote it down. Okay? So that's really interesting because if it's storytelling, guess what happens in storytelling? <laughs> Nuance, emotion, all that stuff that happens in human communication that's 92% of how we communicate. That's why I wear a mask, right? So you can't see me anymore. <laughs> Right? The whole point is, human communication isn't verbal. It's verbal plus all this stuff. And if the narrating, came, if the narrating is storytelling, then the real issue that we have to ask is, how was the story told? And in Hebrew, this is wonderful, in Hebrew with no vowels, the reader has to interpret the story through the, the, the no vowels so that I will communicate the emotion, the mood, the inflection, right? Has to be done in storytelling. It can't be done from reading it. And in fact, there's a really interesting thing that happens in Hebrew. It's called karikativ. And it's, it's really cool. There's, there's a tradition in Hebrew that as you're reading the text, there are some words that you don't read. You just leave them out. They're in the text. You read a different word instead. Okay? So there's a word that's there, but you don't read that word, you put another word in. And substitution. Yeah, you substitute, okay? That's one version. The other version is that you, that you, it isn't that you leave out a word, is that you insert a word that isn't there. It isn't there at all and you put it in when you read it, why? Because the tradition tells you that in order to make, for the story to make sense, some words have to be left out and other words have to be added. And how would you know that? If you're reading the text, the word is there, or it's not there. And the tradition, the person who told you how to read it, because you can't read it unless you already know what it says, told you, ah, oh, when we read this verse, we put this word in. And when we read this verse, we leave this verse out, or leave this word out. How would you know that? It's not possible to know it if you just have the scroll. The only way that you know it is by understanding what happens with the tradition of reading, which is the narration, right? The narration is, is as important, if not more so, than the actual text, right? So how are you going to learn that? You have to go to a synagogue and sit down with a Jewish rabbi, and he will tell you, okay, this is how we read this verse. And then you'll say, but rabbi, that word, akal, it's not there says, yeah, I know, but we put it in, <laughs> right? Okay, I mean, I have a friend, he's the, par he's the Rabbi Parma, and this is what we talk about all the time. We get together, um, I have my Coca-Cola, he, he has his coffee, and we talk about the text. And one of the things that 
we talk about is words that are left out and words that are added. And how does he know that? Because he spent his whole life in yeshiva, where they taught him words that are left out and words that are added. But we didn't. What do we have? We have the English translation, where the translator decided to put in the word or to leave out a word without telling us that the tradition was both. It sure does. Are you going to be Ashkenazi or Sephardic? Babylonian. Ah, oh, Babylonian. But now you're really in trouble because now you don't have the same alphabet, right? So, okay, so you see what she's saying? She's saying, listen, in Exodus, it's the narration of the story that matters more than the actual text that we have because the narration puts all this good stuff in about what was happening, right, that you need to know, a good storyteller. Okay, and the problem is, of course, that this indicates that the text is unintegrated, convulsive, it's compensatory power of language to redeem what is essentially raw. It's raw material, right? It's like, I've often said, Hebrew is like the, the screenplay for a movie. It needs you, the director, to fill in all the lighting, the mood, the, inf the intonation, all that kind of stuff, right? That's what Hebrew is like. I'm sorry? To make it more interesting. Well, it's not just to make it more interesting, to make it make sense, right? So the problem is you have a screenplay. The screenplay just gives you the outline of the story, but now you've got to fill it in, right? It's like me filling in the fact that when God says to the woman, the serpent has seduced you into thinking this, and by the way, I'm going to take care of that. You realize that the biggest error that you made was not paying attention to me, but doing something that you thought was a benefit to your husband, and guess what? It backfired, and now, here's the verse, your husband will rule over you. Ah, does that mean that God intended that you should be punished in childbirth and your husband should rule over you? Nope. It means that we've mistranslated both of those. It had nothing to do with pain and childbirth as punishment. And the, the word that's used for rule over you is a very, very strange word. And we have to understand what that means to recognize that that is the collapse of the relationship, not the, not the divine intention, but it's the, it's the failure of the relationship, right? So <coughs> a husband ruling over his wife is exactly what God didn't intend, right? <laughs> okay? And in fact, if you read my book, it'll, t it'll explain to you that the reason that there are seven times more material about the creation of woman than man is because the vocabulary for the creation of woman is royal language, that it's the, it's the sumum bonum of God's creation activity, it's the last thing in creation, that it is a special relationship with built-in radar about what's going to happen between the man, the woman, and God, and that she is ultimately the relationship manager who is attuned to what God wants. Okay? He has to listen to her in order to figure out what it is that God wants him to do. <laughs> right? But, I mean, go look at the Genesis text. Don't believe me, go look at it. Yeah. Go look at the Genesis text, right? Right. Do you see, we made lots of assumptions that get filtered into the text of the Bible so that when we read the scripture, we think we're reading what God says, but in fact, remember, fluid, no vowels, subject to interpretation, it's the paradigm that's dictating how we read it, not, not the text itself, right? Okay? So, all of the sliding meanings of the Exodus will require continual refixing. And what she means is now you're going to go back and try to read Exodus again and you're going to start asking questions about, oh, what does that mean? And, oh, why, why did they say that? And, oh, who was the audience that was involved there? And all that kind of stuff means that you're going to start understanding it as a story. And stories need to be interpreted according to the... Oh, you, can, you don't have to take pictures of this. I give it all to Pat, and you can have it all, okay? I don't want you to have to work any harder <laughs> than necessary, okay? So look at it. It's 
refixing accommodates the claims of the human mouth and the Torah of God because both are involved, right? It's human interpretation of words that God gave, but the words don't come with a meaning built in. They come with the human input that makes sense of those. Just like today, when you read your Psalms or your New Testament, you are, you're putting in the meaning, right? You just have to know if you're on the backwards bicycle or not. You have to know which paradigm you're using, okay? So let's try another one. Uh, <clears throat> she uses a really difficult vocabulary, you know? The modality of redemption is ecstatic, troubled, hurried, unripe. It is a leap rather than a walk. Question rather than answer. This is cool. Think about this, what she's saying. The modality of redemption. Don't you believe in redemption? Yeah. Right? What does she say? In Exodus, redemption is ecstatic. That means it's like, I can't contain myself. It's so awesome. I just can't explain it, but I'm jumping up and down for joy. Okay? Troubled hurried, unripe, okay? It is a leap rather than a walk, question rather than answer. Hey, did you, are you in this group because you finally got sick of, of going to religious assemblies where you couldn't ask questions? <laughs> I mean, you remember you were never supposed to challenge the pastor, you're never supposed to ask a, a question of the priest because they were the ones who understood what God had to say, right? Yeah. That, for a long time, I went to various Christian churches, I tried to be quiet, but it was impossible. Okay. <laughs> so what I would do is I would send a message to the pastor after his sermon saying, you know, you forgot about this passage in the Septuagint and there's these problems that you have with your, you know, with your exegesis. And most pastors went crazy. I mean, they just didn't want me there because they didn't want somebody who would challenge them about anything. There was only one pastor who was in a congregational church and he and I had a great time because I would get together with him on Sunday afternoon and we'd go over his sermon and we'd talk about all this kind of stuff. And we both learned a whole lot. But the rest of the places were places where you couldn't ask questions, right? Because you were challenging the authority of the religious establishment. Well, hopefully that doesn't happen here. If it does, I'll, I'll beat him to death, <laughs> right? <laughs> It has to, it, you have to be able to ask questions. Even the most obvious things are often questions, right? In fact, if you really learn how to read scripture, you will have more questions than answers. Yes. Just like Yeshua. Did he ever actually answer anybody who asked that question? No. He usually gave them another question. Right. And if he didn't give them another question, he gave them an answer to a question they didn't ask. Right? He was being rabbinic. Right? <laughs> the purpose of a rabbi <clears throat> was not to train his disciples to think like him. It was to train his disciples to ask questions. Because if you don't know how to ask the question, any answer will do. Right? So the whole point of scripture is to force you to ask questions. When you read the text, you should be asking, what does that mean? Why did he say that? How come you use this word instead of that one? A question, question, question. And the more questions that you have, the more intense your experience with God will be. Why? Because God doesn't do anything but ask you questions. <laughs> yeah. The more, the more experience you have with asking questions, the more intense your experience with God will be. Because why? Because God is a God who asks questions. Right? What does Abraham Heschel say? The most important question a man can ever ask is, God, what do you demand of me? And the answer is, yeah, God starts asking you questions about your life. Right? So here, Exodus, Zornberg points out that Exodus is filled with dissonance and problems and all kinds of chaos and everything else. And think about it. The children of Israel for 40 years, that's what Exodus is about, did they have just, you know, they walked out the door and the moose was there. No. They had all kinds of problems. All kinds of problems. And that's what the story is about. How people had all kinds of problems when they were supposed to be following God. Right? What do they say? We will hear and we will do. Great. Oh, another place they say, we will do and we will hear. So, do you understand how important that is? One of them says, 
tell us what you want us to do and we'll do it. The other one says, we'll do it and then tell us what we want to do, or what you want us to do. Why do we need both versions? It's both versions, and, and one is in Numbers, one is in Exodus. Why? Same event, different interpretation. Why? Because one of them says, we heard what you said and we will do it. The other is, we know who you are and whatever you say, we will do. Okay? We will do and we will hear. Okay? So, redemption is about restoration and renewal. We all knew that. It is about a second chance to grow again. But this requires two important things. Desire and space. What does she mean? You need to have more room? No, she means you have to have an internal space where you can debate with God where you can feel like you're free to ask him things, where you don't feel like you're... Con- and by the way, this is really interesting because the word in Hebrew for, re- for redemption means open space, right? In other words, you want God to open up your space so that you feel free to interact and to question and to debate and to be like Moses. You can't do that. Think about this. This is really crazy. What does Moses say to God? You know, you can't do that. Your reputation will be sullied. People will think you just brought us out in the wilderness to kill us all. Do you really want people to think that, God? Right? Abraham should have been trained by Moses because he's just stopped short. He got down to, what is it, five? And then he said, okay, I better not push this anymore. Right? But the point is, interacting with God is sometimes arguing, like David Right? Sometimes it's debating with God and saying, why are you doing this? What's the matter with you, God? You can't be God. You're supposed to take care of this problem. Ah, that's a really interesting thing because there's a book by David Lambert called How Repentance Became Biblical. And what he points out is that in the Old Testament, repentance doesn't mean confession, penance, forgiveness. You know what it means? It means being so dramatic that you force God to do something. <laughs> that's what it means. Right? In other words, David, a lot of David's psalms are divine drama plays where he says, what's the matter with you, God? You're God. How can you let this stuff go on? How, how can you let my enemies succeed when you're God and I'm your king? What's the matter with you? How come you don't get up there and take care of those people? Fix right? Fix them. Where's that nine millimeter? <laughs> right? I mean, that's David. He's saying, look, what's the matter with you as God? You're God. I believe you're God, so fix this thing. And by the way, I'm going to make so much noise that you can't ignore me anymore. Right? Do you remember when Esther walks in? Right? If the king doesn't look in her direction, toast. So what does she have to do? She has to hope that the king will look in her direction. So you're hoping that God will look in your direction. And how do you get him to do that? You make enough noise so that he pays attention. Right? What does Abraham Heschel say about prayer? He says, prayer is not asking God to do things. Prayer is, the, the intention of prayer is to get God to look in your direction. That's all that's required. Just to be noticed by God. That's what he says. Prayer is our attempt to be noticed by God. Why? Because once God notices, he's already promised that he's benevolent, caring, forgiving, etc. What I want him to do is pay attention to me. Right? So read the Psalms like that. Oh, now here comes a burning question. Okay, give me the burning question. Some questions God does not want us to Some questions. Some questions God does not want us to ask. Really? What would those be? That exact word, really? <laughs> you, you really want me to do that? He doesn't want us to ask that question. Well, I'm, I'm confused. Give me, no, I, this is impossible. You're in an impossible situation because I'm going to ask you for a question that God doesn't want you to ask. And then you have to tell me what the question is, and then you'll be violating the commitment not to ask the question. Yes. I can tell you the experience profoundly. Would you uh, like to know the experience? I, 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 I'm interested to know why you think God wouldn't want me to ask any question that I want, because he even entertains questions about his own existence. Mm-hmm. What happens when you ask the question and it makes him mad? 
Ah, but that's okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, God gets mad, right? Mm -hmm. Good. He also, by the way, repents of being mad. Yes. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to ask questions that make God mad because now you have his attention. What right? is the result? Oh, the result can be pretty awful stuff. Yes. Okay? <laughs> can be. But can. doesn't have to be. Yes. Right? So for, uh, this is a good example. I'll give you a good example. So Jeremiah wants to pray for the people because he knows some bad things are coming. Right? What does God say to him? He says, no, I don't want you to pray for these people because they need to have the bad things come in order to get to the next step so that they will understand my forgiveness and reattach themselves to me. So is God definitely didn't want Jeremiah to ask, right? There were really bad consequences, but when we look at it from 1,000, 2,000 years later, we can see the plan that was involved, right? Okay? Um, <clears throat> yeah. I don't think there are any questions that God wouldn't entertain. But some questions have very severe consequences. <laughs> okay? Yes. Mm. Okay. Desire must be discovered, she says. Space must be acquired. Inability to tolerate empty space limits the amount of space available. Inability to tolerate empty space. That means if, you, if your religion depends on having all the right answers, you're already wrong. Right? Because God doesn't give you all the right answers. He doesn't give you even all the answers. Right? If you have to have a religion that has all the answers, then you really are worshiping the God of certainty, not the God of the Bible. Because the God of the Bible doesn't give you all the answers. Why? Because if you have all the answers, you don't need faith. If you have all the answers, you don't need to trust. Right? Do you have to have faith that 3 plus 3 is 6? Why not? Because 3 plus C is 6. There's no... Uh, if you have children, of course you do. That's why you asked that about that verse. <laughs> okay? Okay? If your child... How, how old is your youngest child? 19. 19. My gosh, you must have been married at 12. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. So your 19-year-old, if he came home and said, hey, mom, I just discovered in the woke economy that 3 plus 3 is 7, mm -hmm. you might remind him that it doesn't quite work like that, okay? And that when the, Fed, when the, when the uh, government accounting office discovers that the uh, Department of Education made a $300 billion error in accounting for student debt, mm -hmm. that they can't just pretend it isn't there, okay? All right? So, you don't have to have faith about that because that's the reality. But if you don't have all the answers in your life, you need to have faith about some things, and God wants you to have faith so he doesn't give you all the answers. Pretty simple, huh? Right? So if we believe in a religion that has to have all the answers, we don't believe in a biblical religion because that would mean we wouldn't have to have faith. Trust. You know, the, the word in Hebrew, emunah, means trust. It means reliability. It means something I can stand on. It doesn't mean certainty. And in fact, certainty is a... Oh, I'll give you one other little interesting hint. In biblical Hebrew, there is no word for doubt. Did you know that? Yes. Oh, Pat taught you that. <laughs> okay. In rabbinic Hebrew, there is a word for doubt. But there's no word for in biblical Hebrew. Why? Because in biblical Hebrew, the world is digital. I trust or I don't trust. There isn't a case where I might trust. Or maybe I trust but not quite enough. Right? We have, in Christian thought, this problem. This is my faith bottle. And it has a little bit of doubt in it. You see this space here at the top? And if I just have enough faith and fill it all up, then I can move mountains. Right? That's not a biblical idea. The biblical idea is faith has nothing to do with how much capacity I have. Faith has to do with whether I trust. And it's either a yes or no. I trust God or I don't trust God. Okay? So there's no room for doubt because it doesn't even get into the equation. Okay? And then you're going to tell me, yeah, but what about James when he says, like a double-minded man who is pushed by the waves. Da, da, da. Okay? Greek. We'll worry about the Greek later. <laughs> okay? 
So, the pe- oh, so na- yes. Oh, am I running out of time? Oh my gosh, I'm running out of time. We just got to hardly even got started. Is that okay? I'm so sorry. It's hard for me not to get onto this, you know, because it's interesting stuff, right? Is okay. Is it? Is it? We'll stay a little bit longer. I'll do my very look. There's like 20 more of these, so I'll just. And this is only the first one. I came with eight, you know. So. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so I tell you what. We'll just do a, a, just finish up one more thought, okay? Uh, this is the thought, and it's about the golden calf. You know, what's really interesting about the golden calf is the golden calf represents something that we all struggle with. We just don't interpret it as a golden calf. The golden calf was the, was the Israelites' concern with certainty about what they believed. Why? Because they could see the golden calf. It was right there in front of them, right? Where was Moses? Who knows? He went away a month and a week ago. We haven't seen him since. Who knows what happened to him? So let's have something that we can touch, feel, that's certain. Okay? And um, there's a great commentator who talks about this as Egyptomania. Egyptomania. It's the desire to know for certain. It's the desire to have it all laid out so that you don't have to worry about anything because you've got all the answers. It's Egyptomania. And what happens, of course, is that the specter of the golden calf follows that generation for the next 40 years. They have to die out because they came out of Egypt with this Egyptian thinking that didn't go away. Right? They're the ones who complained about not having meat. They're the ones who complained about being taken out in the wilderness so that they could be killed. They're the ones who complained about going back to Egypt because it was so nice there. Right? Egyptomania. Give me a life where I have the answers. And God says, no. You need to trust me in the wilderness. Why? Because you can't live in the wilderness on your own. It's not possible to live there. That's why God is there. By the way, God's home is in the wilderness places where you can't live, right? The whole point of taking the people into the wilderness is so that they would realize that they utterly have to depend on God, not on themselves, right? He takes them there on purpose. Why does he give the Torah at Sinai in the middle of nowhere where you can't possibly survive? Because the Torah is the bread of life, right? And if you can learn to live by what he gives you, then you don't have to worry about the environment that you're in, right? Because the environment is telling you you can't survive. There's all kinds of interesting things going on with the golden calf that shows up again and again and again through the whole history of Judaism, not just in the Exodus, the whole history. And it's our history because the more doctrine and dogma we need in order to believe, the more we are entertaining Egyptomania. Right? The more we want all the answers. I can't believe in less this, 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 this. Okay? And God says, Mazel tov. <laughs> right? right? Good luck. Because and even life doesn't work out like that. How many of you have got such a great plan in life that everything happened exactly the way you wanted it to? Right? So he's saying, look, the whole purpose of life is trust me. Not let me tell you everything that's going to happen, but trust me. Okay? And by the way, that's the most difficult thing to do when you live in the wilderness. Right? So she says, their pathology is not a feebleness of memory. Rather, it is the unrecognized survival of memory, the repressed desire for the golden calf that, me, that remains strong in their hearts, even as they intone the formula of a new faith. The people are in the grip of an involuntary and, dis, and disguised memory. They think they know how to ride a bicycle because they've always done it like this. It's the paradigm. It's that underlying assumption that makes you think this is the way the world must be because that's what I believe, okay? Consciously, they accept the revolution of Sinai. Unconsciously, they stubbornly retain the pieces of the past. And that's where we are, guys. 
we are, in, until, we get, until we come to terms with our Egyptomania, we are hauling pieces of the past with us that interpret how we understand our relationship to God and our relationship to the text. Okay? So we'll continue talking about what, the tech, what happened in the text, but you can see that no matter what happens in the history of the text, the real issue is how does it affect your experience because of the assumptions that you already had? Yes. That's okay. She, she said, I was reading uh, some of the Humash, and there's a lot of rabbinic commentary, but I find that... There's a lot of uh, oral history in the commentary that is not actually in the scripture. There's oral stories, and what I found confusing is they say, well, it's actually there in the Hebrew, but... In the, it gets lost in the translation from the Hebrew to the English. So um, I'm just wondering about that. I mean, all this oral history that yeah. the rabbis are talking about, sure. but it's not actually. And I, I feel like some of it might actually conflict with, with what actually happened. Okay, good. So let's talk about that. First, of course there's an oral history because there's narrative. And I have to explain the narrative, and I need to adjust the scripture to fit the narrative. Where does the narrative come from? The tradition, how you grew up, what you were taught, all that kind of stuff, right? You, uh, I'll, <clears throat> let me give you just one example. Uh, when you do a Rev Shabbat, do you light the candles, uh, feel the warmth, put the, the shawl over your head and say the, the Rev Shabbat prayers? No. You don't do that. Okay. Okay, that's fine. But you know that Jews, many, many Jews follow that pattern, right? That on Friday evening, when the sun goes down, by the way, when the sun goes down is also determined by tradition. When the sun goes down, you light the candles. The woman lights the candles, puts a shawl over her head, feels the warmth of the candles, and says a prayer which, in, which uh, initiates the, the Shabbat, okay? All right, cool. Do you know where that idea came from? Ah, there's a, there was a rabbi in Sfat, which is a town in Israel. He was a Kabbalist. And he said to his audience, we can't have these people doing whatever they want on Erev Shabbat. We need conformity. And so he came up with the rituals that have now been in place for two or three hundred years so that everybody thinks that's what they always did. Right? Just like we think, that's what the text always said. Okay? Just like you're suggesting that the oral tradition often conflicts with the scriptural written tradition, but the tradition is the way that we've always read it. So they just correct it. Right? No different than the Christian, com than the tr Christian translation correcting things according to their theological paradigm. The oral tradition does the same thing. It just corrects the Bible to make sure that it matches with the tradition. Right? So, yes, it's confusing, but it's not confusing to a Jew because it, from a Jewish perspective, it's just tradition. Of course it's tradition. If the scripture says something else over here, well, that's because the scripture hasn't been interpreted properly according to tradition. Right? What matters is what you were taught. Not what the text says, because the text is malleable. Okay? And we'll talk about this tomorrow, and you'll see just how malleable the text really is. I mean, because we're still operating under the idea that the scripture is the solid piece, and the oral tradition is the flexible piece. But that's not exactly the case. There's a lot of flexibility in the scripture. Okay, right down to what books are really supposed to be there. Okay, and of course these are not issues for us because we have now graduated in our theology to a point where we're basically post-Reformation. So we have a different view of the canon than the first century had. The first century's view of the canon was much more flexible and so they needed all that narrative to tell them how it all works. Okay, make sense? No. Yes, ma'am. Is that okay? Do, does that help? Yeah, that's fine. 
Okay. Yeah. The only thing I could draw from was when the people in First Samuel eight said, "Hey, here's the king." He's like, "Well, here's what he's going to do." It's like, here's the result of your choice. Sure. There's always result of choice, right? I never saw it that way before. It's very good one to first. Yeah, but that's what God says. He says, "Okay, so look, you made a big mistake, and here's the results of your choice. Your husband will now think that he's in charge. Why? Why will he think that?" Because he got punished for listening to you. And so, of course, what he's going to say is, not my fault, look at her. Right? Isn't that what Adam says? Hey, look, God, it wasn't my fault. It was that thing that you gave me. <laughs> look what she did to me. Right? I mean, that's exactly what Adam says. He actually, Adam says, that it's not my fault. It's the woman and you, God. Because if you'd made her better, she wouldn't have done this to me. Okay? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on in that. But the point is, God says, there's consequences. And one of the consequences is that your husband will no longer trust you. And as a result of not trusting you, guess what he's going to do? He's going to rule over you. He's going to try to take control. Which doesn't work out too well, because in the fourth chapter, what does the woman say? I'll get even with you. That's what she says. I will get a new man with the help of the Lord. In other words, screw you, I'll get my own man. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I mean, that's all in the text. You just have to be able to read it in Hebrew so you can see what the underlying narrative is, right? The little hints here and there. Okay? Go, go get the book Guardian Angel. You'll be shocked. Okay. <laughs> Keep going, the gematria, the keep going. It's all of those. Well, so my, when I was listening to her answer to her, I thought that the oral history was not necessarily a correction of what was happening, but rather it was stories intended to teach you how to think. Yes, and sometimes stories teaching you how to think are corrections, and sometimes they're contradictions, and sometimes they're paradoxes, and sometimes... You just can't make any sense out of them at all. But they keep getting passed on because the oral Torah in an Orthodox community is valued as much as the written Torah. Why? Because the sages who were inspired by God gave these instructions based on the, supposedly based on the written Torah. Right, and so the caution here is not to take them as scripture, but rather just to take it with a grain of salt, and use it as a Okay, but that's tool. a really interesting comment. What you said is the caution is to not to take them as scripture. What you just implied was scripture is true and the oral Torah is less. Not to take them as scripture. Scripture is in a higher place. Okay? That's what you implied. Right. So your assumption is that the real word of God is scripture, and this is, you see? And that assumption governs what you think of the written text. And what I will show you tomorrow is the written text is full of contradictions, paradoxes, all kinds of dilemmas, everything else. And it was fluid in the first century, so nobody actually was worried about it. Right? You're worried about it now because you have in your assumption that the standard is Scripture, and we should all measure according to that. So the oral Torah is less, right? But in the first century, if I told you in the first century, the only thing that was standard were the five books of Moses. Everything else was like, okay? Like, who, uh, which assembly did you go to? Then you would have Enoch, or the Assumption of Moses, or whatever, right? Or maybe you had the Psalms that were in Qumran, but aren't in our Bible. The Psalms after 150, okay? So, what is scripture? Oh, so you're going to be a Sadducee now. And you're going to tell them, I mean, that's exactly right. So the Sadducees believed that the only authoritative text were the five books of Moses. Okay, that's okay. I like Sadducees, except for one problem. In the five books of Moses, there's no mention of 
resurrection. So the Sadducees could legitimately argue that the resurrection was impossible, there couldn't be an atomic bomb, because my paradigm says there isn't any resurrection because Moses doesn't talk about it. Therefore, a claim of the resurrection has to be false because it isn't in the five books of Moses. Well, you see the problem? I'm so glad you asked that question. Come back tomorrow.